thank you all for the uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for that generous introduction. It's always fun to come here. It's a real honor and privilege to be to come here as a speaker. I've been here to many other events. It's also pretty cool for me to be in a courtroom and uh, being able to talk about what I really want to talk about, which is history, instead of arguing somebody's law case, which I did for so many years. Um, what I want to talk to you about today, um, and there are many ways to get at this, uh, but is this crucial three months in American history that I think is terribly neglected in our history, and we are such a critical part of it here in South South Virginia, and it needs to be much better known. Um, the way I'm going to start with this is I'm going to start at um, October the 19th, 1781. So on October 19th, 1781, the British Army, commanded by Charles Lord Cornwallis, marches out of Yorktown onto what we now call Surrender Field, lays down their guns, and surrenders in mass to the Franco-American Army led by George Washington. It was a magnificent victory that, for all intents and purposes, ended the American Revolution. There would be a, a, a while yet for to wrap up the details. But with that great victory, the British public and the British government lost any interest in continuing the war, and our independence was won. Now, folks, if I was meeting with you right here uh, in this village at the beginning of this year, 1781, nine months, ten months before this event, and I said to you that before this year is over, the British Army will completely surrender and we will have won this war, you would have thought I was out of my mind. And you would have been very reasonable to do that. Because the reality is, when the year began, 1781 began, there was almost no prospect of anything like this happening by the end of the year. And in fact, it was one of the darkest periods in American history. The story I'm going to tell you this morning, this afternoon, is the story of the greatest turnaround in American history and the very crucial role that the people of South South Virginia played in making it happen. Something we all need to know, we need to remember it, and we need to pass it up. So in order to tell you what happened um, here, uh, or what happened in uh, 1781, let me first give you the, the background. So let's start with the military situation. I'm talking about the background at the beginning of 1781. And let's remember, the Revolutionary War began in April of 1775 at, at Lexington and Common. So in, 18, in 1781, we've been going almost six years. So where does it stand at that point? Well, uh, the military situation, what was that? Well, General George Washington's army was in various camps outside of New York. He didn't have enough food or shelter or clothing to put them all in one camp. In that respect, it was even worse than it had been at Valley Forge. So he had to break the army up into multiple camps around New York. The British Army, under General Clinton, was in New York. They were happy. They were fed. They were armed, provisioned, well sheltered. The French Army, we had French allies at this point. Where were they? Well, they were in uh, Rhode Island, camped out where they had been since they arrived. And at that point, had done nothing other than cut down every tree in Rhode Island. They had been essentially a non-factor, much to the chagrin of George Washington. Uh, George Washington's army was too weak uh, to challenge the British at that point. And what was the condition of the American army? Yet, yeah, April of seven, uh, January of 1781. Many were not being paid. There was no money to pay them. There wasn't enough food to feed them. There wasn't enough clothing to outfit them. There wasn't enough ammunition and guns to outfit the army. It was in a desperate situation. So desperate that on January 1, 1781, the very beginning of the year I'm talking to you about, the year that we won the war, the first day of that year, the Pennsylvania Line mutinies. These are some of the finest uh, soldiers in the American Army. They mutiny, they arrest any of their officers who won't join them, they start marching on Philadelphia and say, we are going to get what we deserve from Congress and we're going to get it at the point of a bayonet. It was essentially a coup attempt. Now, George Washington managed, uh, in one of the many one great things he did for our country, to, uh, to put that down, to convince them to call it off to go back to camp, uh, but it was a very near disaster. Two weeks later, January 14th, 1781, the New Jersey line mutinies. So now we have a second mutiny in the first two weeks of 1781, the New Jersey line says the same thing. We're not being paid, our families are hungry, our families aren't being provided for, the Congress is reneged on everything it told us it's gonna do, we're gonna go to Philadelphia and we're gonna make them honor their obligations. This time, General Washington knows, I can't just negotiate out of this one, or I'm going to have a, a mutinous army that I cannot control. So he takes stern action. Mad Anthony uh, Wayne uh, captures the uh, mutin mutineers, and the mutineers are forced, while being watched by the rest of the American army, to execute their own officers in a very brutal way. 
It's a story that doesn't often appear in our history books because there's nothing glamorous or glorious about it. Now, it had the effect of dampening any further attempts to mutiny, but does that sound like an army that's going to capture the British uh, army in a few months or an army that's on the verge of dissolution? Now, um, what about the rest of the country? Well, Virginia at that point, in 1781, had been largely spared. We, we had uh, been very instrumental in Virginia in the political and philosophical stirrings up of the revolution, but most of the war had been fought elsewhere. Well, that was about to change dramatically. Also, on January 1, the very first day of this, of this monumental year, Benedict Arnold lands in Virginia, catches a surprise invasion with, uh, among others, the notorious and hated Queen's Rangers, led by John Simcoe, lands on the peninsula uh, east of Richmond and begins marching on Richmond. There is no one there to oppose Arnold's army. Jefferson, governor at the time, is frantically trying to call out the militia. There's no militia to call out. The people that do come out say, okay, we're, we'll muster. Where are our guns? There are no guns to give them. So Arnold is marching on Richmond, essentially unopposed. He marches into Richmond. He extracts a, uh, a uh, uh, payment in exchange for not destroying, or tries to extract a payment in exchange for not destroying the city. Jefferson refuses to negotiate with him, and he burns most of Richmond. Okay, this is January of 1781. And by the way, this is just a few miles, not very far, from where the British Army is going to surrender nine months later. I probably won't need to keep reminding you all of that, but I want you to understand the situation. Now, what was the situation in the deep south states? We, I've said the north. Armies coming unglued, no strength to do anything. Here we are in Virginia. There's a British Army marching around essentially unopposed. What about the deep south? Can you believe that in the deep south the situation was even worse than it was in the middle south and in the north? Um, let's back up in, uh, in um, December of 1779, the British captured Savannah. The British had changed their strategy at this point and said, you know, it's kind of a stalemate in the north. What we're going to do is we're going to take the southern colonies. That's where the money is anyway. That was the prosperous colonies. And we're going to, um, uh, that's where the most of the loyalists are. So that was where their emphasis was. And so at the end of the year of 1779, they captured Savannah. The next uh, May, May of 1780, they captured Charleston. And when they captured Charleston, they captured essentially the entire American Continental Army. The Virginia Continental Line, when Charleston fell, essentially ceased to exist because it was inside Charleston and it was the largest, the worst defeat of the war. The entire army surrendered. Well, actually, not quite the entire army. There was, there were some Brit uh, Virginia Continentals that were on their way to Charleston to join the army there. They didn't get there before the surrender. When they heard about the surrender, they turned around and made it, started heading back to Virginia. These were Virginia Continentals commanded by Colonel Buford. Well, Banish of Tarleton of the British Legion wasn't going to allow them to get away that easily. So he ran them down, caught Colonel Buford's men at a place called Waxhaws, and essentially slaughtered them. We now call it the Buford of the, uh, the Waxhaws Massacre. Uh, most of the Americans who were killed in that fight were killed after they had surrendered. That is, uh, of course, a, a pretty grim situation. Congress hurriedly patches together another army to send to the South. Now, at this point, there is no army in the South. It's been completely annihilated. But they patch together an army. They assign command of the army to uh, Horatio Gates, the hero of uh, the hero of Saratoga, a title that he did not deserve, but that's a story for another day. They give command of the army to Horatio Gates, and he starts marching toward the south, gathering militia and whatever other uh, soldiers he can get to try to put up some kind of resistance to the British in the south. Gates gets to a place called uh, Camden, which is across the border in South Carolina, uh, in, in South Carolina, and there his army is utterly annihilated. And the fact I want you to remember is that the, the Virginia militia who were at Camden, and many of the men who were at Camden, by the way, some of you are, are probably there, they may be your ancestors. These are men who are going to come up again later in my story. The Virginia militia at Camden, when the British attacked, threw down their guns and ran away, most of that firing a single shot. That was because they were being poorly led, not because they were cowards, but it was a disgraceful performance that contributed to the disaster that happened in Camden. Now, once again, now that's the second American army in the South, completely destroyed. At this point, Congress finally does something smart. They ask George Washington who should take command in the South, and he, um, and he 
recommends Nathaniel Green, who was given command of the Southern Army. Uh, Green heads south. Green is a born a Quaker from Rhode Island. He's a fantastic story that, that there's no time to tell right now. But he gets to North Carolina. He finds the remnants, the fragments of this shattered army. And he is absolutely astonished at what he discovers. Now, granted, he's been in the north. He's seen this disintegrating army. He was at Valley Forge. But what he saw in North Carolina, the men from Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia that were in that army, uh, astonished him. The men, many of them, were almost literally naked. And when we hear that the men in the army of the uh, American Revolution were barefoot and naked, I always thought that was a metaphor. That just meant they weren't adequately clothed. The men in the letters he wrote back, he described as wearing loincloths like Indians do, because it's all they had to wear. They had no um, supplies, inadequate guns. He says uh, in, a number, in a letter he wrote Thomas Sumter, he said, more than half our number are in a manner naked, so much that we cannot put them on the least kind of duty. There are a great number that have not a rag of clothes on them, except a little piece of blanket, which they wear in an Indian form around their waists. There would be very little reason to think that such an army would be in a position to stop from Wallace, who commanded, at that point, some of the finest soldiers on the planet Earth. Uh, in January of 1781, William Davis wrote Thomas Jefferson the governor. Now again, this is, uh, uh, pardon me for, but I want to just keep driving this point on. This is, we're in the same year, 1781. This is what Davis tells the governor about the militia in Virginia who need to be sent to reinforce the Daniel Reed. Quote, many men have not a remnant of clothing larger than a good napkin to cover their nakedness, and a number of these are dependent for others for part of a blanket to shelter them at night in the cold. Some of them are so naked that they are refusing furloughs to go home to get clothes because they are too ashamed to travel in the condition they're in. That's the military state of affairs in America at the beginning of 1781, north, middle country, south. There's nothing good in that picture at all. There's nothing promising in that picture at all. That's what they who's going to be here on this one. Now, what about the home front? You won't be surprised when I tell you the situation on the home front was terrible in 1781. The economic economy in the United States in 1781 was worse than it has ever been in our history. Worse by far than even during the Great Depression. There was a scarcity of everything. There was no money at all. There was a scarcity of everything. Uh, if you couldn't grow it or make it yourself, you had to do without it. Particularly important was the absence of salt, which now we think of as a seasoning for food, but in 1781 was essential to the preservation of food. We had runaway inflation, so we get concerned now, and rightfully so, when we're looking at 5% uh, inflation. The inflation at this point was caused by the fact that early in the war, what little money there was in the colonies was spent early in the fighting the war. At that point, Congress and the state governments had no money to pay soldiers to buy supplies. So they did what governments always do when they run out of money. They start printing money. They start printing paper and calling it money. Now, in the early time, when that first began, the people uh, of the colonies, the Americans, um, the patriots, were patriotic about that. They circulated the money. They, they, they recognized, accepted it as money, and they treated it like it's, a, it's an IOU saying, when the war's over and things are better, you can turn this in for actual gold or silver. But by 1781, that game was up. They knew. They were just printing out more of this paper all the time. There was virtually no chance it was ever going to be turned into real money. And so uh, the paper money became worth, worthless, less and less valuable, which caused the price of goods to go up and up even more. If you've heard the expression as worthless as a continental, that's talking about those pieces of paper that they called money and they called them continentals. The official exchange rate in Virginia at the beginning of 1781 was 75 to 1. That is, you could take 75 paper dollars and get one dollar for gold or silver. Primary source accounts that I've found say that in truth, it, that may have been the official rate, but in truth it was 150, or more like 150. By the end of the year, 1781, it was 250, um, which meant, you know, they're saying this in hyperinflation, which has happened, it happened at the end of the Civil War, it happened in post-war Germany, saying that at the beginning of the war, you would go to the market with your money in your purse, uh, with money in your pocket, and you come back with your food in a basket. At this time, you go to the market with your money in a basket, and you come back with your food in a pocket, because there was just no money. A, a bushel of potatoes in 1781 would cost, uh, cost over $200. Now, at, 
in normal money before the disaster, that would have been just a few pennies. Thomas Jefferson said at this point that the paper money has no more value than oak leaves. Um, citizens are beginning to refuse to accept it. If you try to pay with it, they won't take it because they know two days later it's going to be worth less before they can spend it. Governments are forcing them to take it. Even the most diehard patriots are starting to lose their resolve. Is this really what we're doing? If we, have, if we have no chance of winning, why are we destroying the economy? They're beginning to ask those questions. There was unrest. There was a weakening of the, of the patriotic fervor. And then on top of everything else, the government, when people wouldn't take the money, began impressing what they needed. What that meant is, they would come to you, they would offer to buy your horse, you would say the horse won't sell the horse, the horse is not for sale, they would say, okay, we're taking the horse, here's a receipt. At the end of the war, you can turn this in and, and, and get paid for it. So on homesteads all around here, and all over the state, all over the country, horses, draft animals, pigs, wheat, anything, if you had a gun, and there were a few of those left, it could be taken, you were given a receipt, you may or may not ever see the money for it. In fact, you wouldn't see the money for it. Now, as I said before, American economy has never been in a worse shape than it was in at that time. Um, for men and boys 16 years and up, you also face the prospect of being drafted. Uh, drafted or, or uh, you might volunteer, but at that time with constant drafts. For women, they had the risk that their, their husbands, their brothers, their sons, their fathers would be sent off uh, to fight and might never come home again or might come home again missing an arm or a leg. If that wasn't enough, if you lived on the frontier, and we weren't very far from the frontier at that point. Uh, you know, we often think of the Revolutionary War as the Continentals against the Redcoats, and that, of course, was part of the Revolutionary War. But there were three wars going on simultaneously. Uh, the second war that was going on was on the frontier. At, uh, during the Revolutionary War, the Creek, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, uh, the Shawnee, the Iroquois, they all allied with the British. The only tribe that allied with the Patriots was the Catawba, they were a very small tribe. And that wasn't because they believed in our cause, it was because they hated the Cherokees. But in any event, uh, on the frontier, the British were encouraging the Indian attacks on settlers. Hundreds, hundreds of families were massacred, slaughtered on the frontier during the war. Um, you could be out plowing your field or spinning, and um, Indians could attack, kill your whole family. Now, when the militia responded to those Indian attacks, they responded brutally. So Indian villages were being wiped out as well. It wasn't a one-way street. But that was the situation for people on the frontier in the 1781. Now, um, there was also the Third War that we never talk about very much. That was the very brutal civil war that was going on throughout America at the same time that these conventional and Indian wars were going on. When we think of uh, the American Civil War, it's one section of the country against another. This was neighbor against neighbor. A very large percentage of the American population were loyalists. Um, the Patriots and the Loyalists fought each other in guerrilla warfare, uh, varying degrees of savagery, um, and it was a, a brutal affair, particularly in the up countries of North Carolina and South Carolina. Uh, the uh, fighting there was uh, you had murder, you had arson. Uh, Nathaniel Green, when he got to the South, and again, he had seen Loyalist versus Patriot fighting in the North. He wasn't immune to this. He wasn't new to that. But here's what he wrote to George Washington when he got here. He said, the difference in New England between Whig and Tory, which is another way of saying Patriot and Loyalist, is little more than a division of sentiment. But here, in the South, they persecute each other with little less than savage fury. The sufferings and the distress of the inhabitants beggars all description and requires the liveliest imagination to conceive of the cruelties and the devastations which prevail. British General uh, O'Hara wrote that it is beyond the curb of even religion and humanity. In other words, what he's saying is even basic morals and religious principles aren't enough to stop these people from murdering each other and slaughtering each other. Uh, Captain William Pierce wrote to St. George Tucker in July of 1781, such scenes of desolation, bloodshed, and deliberate murder I was never a witness to before. You look at the weeping widow, the fatherless child, they wound the principles of humanity. The two opposite principles of Whigism and Toryism have set the people in this country to cutting each other's throat. And scarcely a day passes but some poor deluded Tory is not beaten to death at his door. I could go on and on. But that's the situation. There is no civil uh, uh, authority in many places in the South as well. If now, here in Virginia, even in Southern Virginia, 
we had this kind of thing, murder and arson and uh, that civil war. But it never reached the level of what was going on 50 miles south of here, certainly not 200 miles south of here. Why is that? Well, the only reason is because Cornwallis didn't cross the Dan River in Virginia. Cornwallis had issued instructions to the Tories, to the Loyalists, stay low, don't reveal yourself until our army is here. He had done that because a couple of times in North Carolina, they jumped the gun, rose up too soon, his army didn't get there in time, and the Patriots slaughtered him. So he said, you stay quiet until I'm close, then you rise up. And that's what would have happened here, and we would have had the same thing going on in our backyard uh, that was happening elsewhere uh, throughout the country. We know, now, one of the most intriguing things about researching this era is there is very little information, almost none, to identify who were the Tories at the time. Why do you think that is? Because they didn't, they didn't reveal themselves. If the, if the government came around, the Patriots came around and said, sign this oath of allegiance, they signed it. If they said, we're impressing this week, they gave it to them. Um, because if they had revealed themselves, they would have been uh, stripped of all their property and deported, if not hanged. So I'm absolutely convinced that many folks today who are members of the DAR and the SAR are in fact descended from Tories who just didn't dare reveal themselves. None of you, of course, and certainly not me, but, but there are those out there. Now, um, in, in uh, this October of 1780, Thomas Jefferson sends a message to the, to the uh, General Assembly. Again, October of 1780, here's what he wrote. A very dangerous insurrection in Pennsylvania was prevented a few days ago by discovering the ringleaders and seizing them in their beds. So this is a dangerous insurrection that was about to occur here in Pennsylvania County or over there in Pennsylvania County. They got headed off. We have a, a memo from a few weeks later from the acting governor who said that, um, that the three men were named Lay, Billings, and Lawless. The Lay and Billings we cannot identify. Lawless we know was a guy who, like his name sounds, he'd been in and out of jail a number of times. But what the article, go, what, what the letter goes on to say is that there are several persons of more note in Pennsylvania who were mentioned as promoters of this insurrection. And indeed, in all the counties where insurgents have appeared, and that included Henry, and that included uh, uh, Bedford and uh, Halifax, in all the count in counties where the insurgents have appeared, men of note have been named as abettors. So what we're saying is there were prominent people behind the Tory loyalist movement here in our area as well. And we have just been prevented by history because of the way things happened from knowing uh, who they were. So I'll come back to the question I asked again. With that state of affairs, it couldn't be any worse. I can't think of anything that would make it worse. Uh, it's just virtually impossible to imagine the greatest turnaround in American history is about to occur. But why did it happen? Uh, why were we able to win that war at that very year that I've just described? George Washington's answer was pretty simple. He said it was uh, uh, providence, God. God chose to let us win the war. I'm, I'm not going to try to defend that proposition. It's just, it's just too difficult. But whether divine intervention played a role or not, the fact of the matter was that it was believed at the time and continued to be believed. But I think that we tend to, as Americans, feel that there's something inevitable about once the Declaration of Independence was issued in July of 1776, there was something inevitable about our independence. You know, we might compress it in our minds and go, well, there's uh, Lexington and Concord, and then there was Bunker Hill, and then there was Valley Forge, and then there was Yorktown. But that is not what happened. Nothing like that at all. In fact, it, it got a lot worse before it ever got better. Um, so what did happen? Well, the first of uh, the most uh, incredible series of events uh, was the Yorktown campaign. And just to collapse it into a few sentences, Washington fakes out Clinton in New York, leads him to believe that he's about to attack New York, marches his entire army from New York to Virginia, gives him a slip before Clinton knows what's going on. The French get out of their camp for the first time in Rhode Island, join him on the way, and they march 700 miles before the British are able to react and get to Yorktown to surround uh, the British. It was an incredible and amazing feat. Um, at the same time, the British Navy, which had been dealing with bigger fish to fry, and that is the more important colonies, Jamaica and the Caribbean, is convinced to take a break, just while we're waiting out the hurricane season, sail up to the Chesapeake Bay and help us. And they arrive just in time, I mean, literally in the nick of time, to get the jump on the British and defeat them at the Battle of the Capes. And that sealed the deal. At this point, with the, with the French victory and the Battle of the Capes, uh, Cornwallis is doomed. But what 
was Cornwallis doing in Yorktown in the first place? The last time we mentioned Cornwallis, he was down in South Carolina uh, having his way. Well, I submit that the story that ends gloriously in Yorktown in October 1781 began at a little village in South Carolina called Cowpens in January of 1781 and set him to motion a series of events that led directly to the surrender of Yorktown and that without the contributions of the men and boys and women and girls of South South Virginia in those crucial months could not have happened. Without the people that lived uh, right around here, we would likely not have won our independence. Now, I'd love to spend a lot of time talking to you about the Battle of Calpins. It is one of the most remarkable stories in American history, brilliantly orchestrated by General Daniel Morgan, who I regard as a quintessential American of many ways. But there's just no time for that. I will say this, the historian Jack Buchanan says of that, that, that Morgan, of all the generals and officers in the Revolutionary War, he said he was the only one, this untutored son of the frontier, the only one who came up with an original tactical thought. Uh, what uh, um, Morgan did at Calvin's was understand how to use militia, which Gates didn't understand. And he created three lines of defense, told the militia on the first line, you fire one or two shots, then you retreat. Don't try to fight the British hand to hand because you're going to lose, you're going to panic and run. Told the second line to do the same thing, and he puts his hardened veterans, his continental, continentals on the third line, and he gives so much attrition by the time they get to the third line that he's able to uh, defeat them. It was brilliant. Banjo Tarleton, who was his hated uh, war criminal who had been brutalizing the people of South Carolina, uh, lost 90% of his command at that battle. But Cornwallis was a tenacious uh, and a very courageous general. Uh, I think we have the impression that he was some sort of aristocratic assistant. That was not the case. Cornwallis says, I will run this man down to the end of the world if I have to. I will get those prisoners back. Because Morgan had taken 800 prisoners uh, from uh, the, some of the best men in the British Army. So at this point, Cornwallis peels out of South Carolina, tearing across North Carolina, which was a basically unpopulated wilderness at the time, saying, I am going to run down Morgan. I am going to get these men back. And that begins our story, uh, the main part of the story. Green and Morgan joined forces after a series of near, near escapes. Uh, again, you got the people in North Carolina. In one case, they renamed their village Providence because they were convinced that after the American army got over the river, God raised the river so the British couldn't get across. They were so awed by that that they changed the name of their town. Whether that was the reason or not, it was a series of near misses, a series of miraculous, near miraculous escapes. They reconvened, the whole army gathers together at Gilbert Courthouse, which is now Greensboro, Daniel Green says, calls a council of war, which is something he hated to do. He gets his main army officers together. He says, gentlemen, what should we do? Do we stand and fight the British now, or do we make a run for it trying to get to Virginia, where we can reprovision, resupply, etc.? And that council of war, they make the decision to make a dash for Virginia. Four miles is 20 miles away at this point. Um, the Virginia militia is not there yet. I'm going to explain to you why in a minute. Green knows he can't fight. Cornwallis and Dr. Virginia Bush. That begins what we now know as the race to the dam. Daniel Green does an amazing thing. Daniel Green, by the way, he has no more military training than I do, which is to say he had none, which is the case with just about everyone of any importance in the American army. So at one point, Daniel Green, so he, he did things all the time that the textbooks would say you don't do. Well, that's because no one ever taught him the textbook. He was a Quaker merchant when the war began. But what he did is he separated his army into two groups created a light corps uh, of about 1,500 men, and he said, I want you guys to march off in this direction, and you're going to make Cornwallis think you're the whole army. Make sure he stays following you. You make like you're marching for the upper fords on the Dan River. I'm going to take the rest of the army and run like crazy to try to reach the ferries at what is now South Boston, Boyd's Ferry and Irvine's Ferry, where he had secretly assembled a lot of boats on the river and kept that information away from the Tory spies who were constantly looking for it. So part of the army goes dashing off towards the northwest. The other goes dashing off to the northeast. The British take the bait. They follow the, the decoy. Uh, Green is able to get most of his army away in time to get him across the river. And then he sends back word uh, to, to the Light Corps, I'm safe, now you need to come. And they have this nip and tuck run with the British and make it across uh, just in time. Across the famous crossing of the dam. Well, that's February 14th, 1781. So that's a great story. That's a miraculous uh, 
averting a disaster, but that's certainly not a victory. That is not going to put you in the position of winning the Revolutionary War. One of the mistakes that I think we make locally, and that I've made myself until I bury myself in this research, there's many of them, but there really weren't any of our guys, any militia from around here, who were part of the race of the day. But there were very few. I was under the impression they were in the race of the day. The militia was still here. But really, the contribution that our militia gave to the army was after the race of the dam was won. Because it wasn't the race of the dam that was going to matter. It was going to be when we got across the dam and uh, Nathaniel Green resupplied, reprovisioned his army, rested them, gathered up all the militia that he could, and went back to fight the British at the Battle of Wilford Courthouse. Starting in January of 1781, Green had been begging Virginia to send militia. I need men. Send me militia. In February and even to March 1781, there was very little Virginia militia with the name Green. Now, why is that? I researched every Revolutionary War pension application from a Pennsylvania County man, Henry County man, in any of this area. And in Pennsylvania County particularly, every single one, without exception, says, I was drafted or volunteered in January. Well, if those men were drafted or volunteered in January, and Green is begging for them, and he was even in the backyard in the middle of February, why did they not show up at Green, Green's army until a few days before the Battle of Ripley Courthouse? The answer is because there were no guns to supply the army. Um, according to um, according to historians who have looked at this, and by the way, very few have, Many of you probably, like me, assume that the Continental uh, settlers at that point, they just took the gun down off the gun rack and ran off the but that's not what happened. In fact, no more than one out of five Virginia militiamen owned his own gun. Most that owned guns at that time owned guns that were suitable for farmers. They were guns that you would use for hunting or guns that you would use for, uh, for killing varmints. They couldn't mount a, bay a bayonet to them. They weren't muskets. They simply didn't have the guns they needed. Riflemen had them, which is another story that I tell later, but Jefferson says that not maybe a fourth or fifth of anyone in this part of Virginia had a firelock that was usable. Uh, interesting thing, I looked at the estate inventory of Joshua Stone. Joshua Stone was one of the captains of the militia at, at, um, at Guilford Courthouse, and he was a, a prosperous man. In, his, um, in the inventory of his estate in 1822, he had, he 12 enslaved people, he owned 11 horses, and he owned a shotgun. He didn't own a musket, and he was in the militia. He was a captain in the militia. The militia law says you're supposed to have a musket and 10 days provisions at all times. Still says that, by the way, but um, it just wasn't the case. So everyone was delayed. At the last minute, the, the, Pitts, the Prince Edward County militia finally just took off to North Carolina just bringing what they had, shotguns, fowlers, uh, whatever they had. Many of them had nothing. They just went unarmed. The, the men of uh, uh, Colonel Lynch, where the men from George Waller's command joined, they had 60 of them out of the 360 when they arrived just before the battle, had no guns. Um, I had applications from men from Bedford County, now Campbell. I have one who said, I would have been in the Battle of Milford Courthouse if I could have had a gun. There are many of us discharged at Long Island on the Stanton River where we had marched because there was an absence of guns. Keep going on. Colonel Perkins arrived with the Virginia militia just before the battle. 50 of his men had no guns. Colonel Munford's men arrived. No guns, no powder, no flint, no ammunition. It was the same all the way across the army. Now, again, one of those miraculous last minute things. 750 muskets from the Petersburg Arsenal showed up right before the battle, so Green was able to, to arm almost all of those men. Jefferson had been partially paralyzed. Remember, there's a British army just outside of Richmond. Do I send the guns to Green? Do I keep them here? That was part of the problem. But now let's go to this dramatic battle of Newport Courthouse. I'm going to hurry through this. Um, on Morgan's advice, General Green adopts the same strategy. Here's the British at the bottom. He puts the, uh, this might not be bad. The first blue line is the North Carolina militia. These are men who have never been in combat before, for the most part, the farmers. The second line is the Virginia militia. And this arrow here, this is the New Garden Road. On the south side of the line, that's uh, where most of the South Side Virginia men are. The north side of the line are men from further north. That's the Virginia militia. And up here are the Continentals, the blue, you know, the, uh, Uniform regulars. Same strategy as it as it um, Give them a couple shots, retreat. Give them a couple shots, retreat, and we'll hold them on the third line. 
Now, what happened here at Guilford Courthouse is one of the most amazing stories in our history, and it's, it's a little now. What happened on the first line of the way is very controversial. General Green said that the North Carolina men threw down their guns and ran without ever firing a shot. And uh, Light Horse Harry Lane repeated that in his, Bible, uh, in his history of the war. I am convinced that is not what happened. Most of them, maybe all of them, did fire a shot. They fired too soon. The British were too far away. Some of them fired a second shot. And it is true that when they ran, they didn't run and reform behind the second line. They ran all the way back to their homes in North Carolina. So it was not a great day for the North Carolina militia, but it was not nearly as disgraceful as what Green said later. Now, had the Virginia line performed, Virginia militia performed the same way the North Carolina militia did, those men on the third line would have been gobbled up. This war would have been over. And there would have been no Southern Army left again, and there would have been probably no way to create yet a fourth. That's not what happened. What happened is truly astonishing. Remember what I said those men did at Camden? They threw their guns out and ran away without firing a shot? That's not what they did at Guilford Courthouse. General Lawson's men, they didn't fare any better than the North Carolinians. Some of them, they only had one man killed in the whole battle. Those men, probably because they weren't properly armed, uh, did, not, did not stand and fight. These men, Perkins militia crooks, these men are General Stevens, on that side of the, of, the, uh, of the New Garden Road, have been given instructions to fire twice, do the best you can, fire twice and retreat. Those men fired up to 20 times. They turned back three British attacks they, until they ran out of ammunition and wore out their flints. They didn't leave that line until Stevens himself was shot down off of his horse. It was one of the most, and these are, these are untrained, largely militia. They fought uh, unlike anything Green had ever seen from militia. Um, I should have mentioned it, I didn't. I don't, excuse me, I don't have a pointer, but I want to tell you all, because we're in Henry County, where the Henry County men under George Waller were. They weren't with the militia here. They were with Lynch's riflemen. Lynch's riflemen from what is now, mostly from what is now Campbell County, were up here on the flank. And their job with these rifles that loaded very slowly but couldn't hold a musket, their job was to be marksmen. And you're to take out as many British officers as you can from up here. So these were some of the crack shots in the entire country. And that's what George Waller's men were. They were crack shot riflemen. Right? And they started doing so much damage early in this battle that Cornwallis pulled his reserves out. His, they were called Jaegers, these German riflemen. He committed all of his reserves because his old regiment, the 33rd, was getting punished badly by these Virginia riflemen here. So he pulled his Jaegers out and sends the Jaegers out to fight them. So here in the woods outside of Greensboro, you've got the, some of the finest shots in America duking it out with some of the finest shots in Europe. These German riflemen against these Virginia riflemen. And that's where the wild uh, wild is. Back to uh, Stevens' men here. They fight until they don't have any ammunition, until their flints are, are, are worn out, and then they finally pull back. And at that point, they fought so much time and done so much damage to the British that uh, even though eventually uh, uh, Green would have to withdraw that third line, they were in a position where um, uh, the British took, they could not defeat and destroy the American army the way they had done in the past. So there on that second line uh, stood probably uh, some of your ancestors. And with order to fire two shots, they fired uh, as many as 20. Um, after the battle, I told you what Green said about the North Carolina militia. He was blistering in his, in his accusations against the North Carolina militia. Here's what he said about the Virginia militia. They behaved nobly and with great gallantry. That was Stevens' brigade. And they had <coughs> Pennsylvania, Bedford, Botetourt, Henry, Lunenburg. It was a magnificent and improbable feat. It did so much damage to the British Army that they simply could not continue their push into Virginia. They had to pull back. They eventually had to go to Wilmington to resupply and then marched to an appointment with destiny in Yorktown. Some of the same boys and men who had fled at Camden saved the day at, um, at Guilford Courthouse. By the end of the year, this is March 15th, by the end of the year, um, the British Army is captured from Yorktown. And the war is won, essentially. Independence was won. Um, this is an illustration of the Guilford Courthouse. And the war's over, and the men can finally go home to smoke their painting of the Revolutionary War. Um, and, you know, we're here as free Americans today because of what happened. Then. Now, that's the story I tell in this book, and I promote the book. Uh, this novel that I wrote incorporates all this research that I've given you. It 
tells a story of the home front and incorporates historic characters, Green, Morgan, William Washington, Lighthorse Harry, William Cornwallis, Carlton, uh, as well as some lesser known ones, Peter Francisco, the heroic trumpeter hero at the uh, <coughs> album's called the Colin. Incorporate fictional families from Bedford County, Pennsylvania, and Halifax. There are Tories, spies, Quakers. My great hope is that people who read this book will come away with an appreciation and understanding of what happened here and how it affected our history and how it changed, not just the outcome of the war, but you know, not just the, this campaign, but the outcome of the war itself. And then I just love this that uh, at Yorktown, this message that George Washington sends Congress that says, I have the honor to inform Congress that a reduction of the British Army and the commander of Lord Cornwallis is most happily effective. So I appreciate your attention. Uh, I hope I didn't bore you with that. Uh, I want to close with this. Uh, a couple of thoughts. You know, in Shakespeare's play Henry the Fourth, uh, Henry the Fifth, he in that famous monologue about band of brothers, he has he has Henry the Fifth say to his men, "This story shall a good man tell his sons." That's how he begins that. And I think if we put that in modern language, this story, good people should tell their children. This story we need to remember and pass on because uh, uh, we need to remember and understand what role that we played in this episode. I want to close with this poem uh, that Ellen Dodell, a poet, wrote on the dedication of the Guilford Battlefield. This is a bit of it. Um, and they were dedicating the Guilford Battlefield in 1892. She says, shall they be unremembered, those heroes of old? Their graves all forgotten, their glory untold? Shall time in his flight bear their prestige away, and the deeds they have done be the thought of the day? Ah, no. From this spot, let a pillar arise. And let the gray of the stone pierce the blue of the skies. Let the evergreen spring where the ashes repose and plant more than sleeping the lily and the rose. So again, thank you all for hearing me out. And uh, be happy to take any questions if anybody wants to. I didn't look at the time to see how bad they did. What was that too bad? Five after, five after four. Yes, sir. I understand that after the war, uh, Virginians, notably Patrick Henry, uh, wanted to put the governor on trial of the military in Providence. Yes, uh, it was it was the um, one of the most of all the political scandals that Thomas Jefferson had to deal with. It was that accusation that he was cowardly during the invasion in the summer of 1781. Uh, Henry was a, could be quite a, a provocateur, as you know. And he, it wasn't just him, but there was it was politicized. But Jefferson was accused of having abandoned his post and run away from the British. Um, that's not what happened. Um, Jefferson was a governor at the time, and he did withdraw with the government to leave to Charlottesville. And there, they were almost nabbed by Vanisher Carlton with Jack Jewett's famous ride, and alerted them, and they got away. But yes, that accusation plagued him the rest of his life. It was used against him in his presidential campaign. Um, Jefferson would freely admit, he said, I'm not a military man. I never have been. I'm not a soldier. But, but he did his best, and uh, but he was accused of that, yes. Anyone else? No? All right, sure. Um, assuming the things that Green said about North Carolina, they were remarkably nice to him after the war. Yeah. Well, he, he said some terrible things about their militia that day, but Green had a disdain for all militia. He, you know, he, he, he praised the Virginia militia, but the first and only time I've ever seen after that episode at Guilford Courthouse. Green said, all the militia's good for is eating up our um, provisions. I can't keep them in camp. They come and go as they please. They have no discipline. Uh, Morgan pleaded with him to say, look, you don't understand militia. You've got to, you've got to deal with them a different way. But yeah, he, um, he, he did say some terrible things. Now, uh, Judge Schenck, who founded the Guilford Battlefield, uh, founded it in part and did all of his research and work to try to re rehabilitate the reputation of North Carolina because of those accusations that Green made. I can understand why Green made them because he couldn't see that first line from where he was. I cannot understand why Henry Lee repeated them because he could. Um, the British accounts of that battle make it very clear that the, the front line, they called them the, uh, they called the, the North Carolinians Irishmen because they were each you know, frontier under Scots Irish. They made it very clear that that front line did a lot of damage to them. But yeah, we, we did not care for the militia at all. Yes, sir. So I always heard that uh, after the Battle of Gilbert uh, Courthouse that uh, uh, soldiers from this area followed Cornwallis to Yorktown. But actually, he went to Wilmington. Where did the Marines' army go after the Gilbert Courthouse? Yeah. Okay, that's 
a great question. Most of the militiamen were all uh, enlisted for 30 days, or I mean for 30 to 60 or 90 days. Most of them went out. Um, but those who were remustered, either in another draft or volunteer or were in the longer term of enlistment, stayed with Green's army. And Green didn't follow Farm Walsh to Yorktown. Green went back to North Carolina into South Carolina. By the end of 1781, Green had reconquered South Carolina, and the only place the British still owned in South Carolina controlled was Charleston itself. Cornwallis went to Wilmington to get resupplied because he didn't have enough food, he didn't have enough provision for his army. He decided to march north. Green thought, if I go to South Carolina, he'll follow me, and didn't. So when Cornwallis got to Yorktown, um, all he had was a very small army commanded by General Lafayette was there at the time that Washington had sent down. But Cornwallis had his way in Virginia for several months. I mean, he just pushed the rank and do whatever he wanted to until this uh, amazing uh, you know, sneak march by Washington caught him by surprise. He got some really bad orders to fortify Yorktown, which is a bad position. But to your question, the Virginia militia that was at Guilford Courthouse were not the same Virginia militia who were drafted and mustered and sent to Yorktown. Some of them may have been the same men, but their terms had expired. They were then drafted in August and September and sent back to, to duty, this time in Yorktown. Some of the same men who were at Guilford were at Yorktown, but it wasn't continuous duty, if that makes sense. Yes, sir? Kate's freedom was abandoned as the army. Did he ever get consequences for that? Uh, he did. He was eventually uh, censured for it. He, of course, quit the army at that point. The question is, what did Gates do? So after Gates got thrashed at Camden, uh, and, and again, this was a man who was regarded by many Americans at the time to be superior general to Washington, because he had the reputation of having achieved this great victory at Saratoga. Um, Gates abandoned his army. He fled all the way to Hillsborough and just left them there, hanging. Um, and um, he was removed from command and never given a, another command. But uh, then he lived out the rest of his life uh, having stayed up in Northern Virginia. He wasn't tried or anything, uh, but he was censured for that. But, uh, it was a disgraceful performance. Anyone else? I know it's hot, and I probably kept you all a long time. I can say I'm, I'm happy to answer more questions if you want to ask me afterwards. I do have copies of my book if anyone would like it. Uh, to get it, it's available at the library if you want to try it out first before you spend 20 bucks on it. Um, it's very heavily um, researched, as I said, and in those areas, very few areas, but when I did deviate from the history, I would reveal that in the author's book. So, uh, all right. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.